Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for braving this sort of gray and wet day for History's Lunch. In the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. A few things to tell you about. Next Tuesday, January 29th at noon at the Manship House Museum, historian and author Grady Howell will present Chimneyville, the destruction of Jackson, Mississippi during the Civil War, fact or fiction. Grady will also be selling and signing copies of his new book on the subject. The program is free, but since the Manship House Museum has limited space for these, it's a good idea to call or email them to reserve a spot if you know that you're going to go. And of course, we thank our friends at the Mississippi Humanities Council for co-sponsoring that program. That same day, Tuesday, January 29th, Hell in High Water, the play actors from New Stage Theater previewed for us here last week, will open. There are flyers about that over on the shelf by the coffee and cookies, along with registration forms for the upcoming annual meeting of the Mississippi Historical Society, which will be held February 28th through March 2nd in Natchez. Um, and in this event is several weeks away, but because of the preponderance of legal minds in our audience today, I did want to mention it. On Tuesday, February 26th, at the Old Capitol Museum, former Rhode Island Supreme Court Chief Justice Frank J. Williams will present Ulysses S. Grant, Reconstruction and Civil Rights. Looking forward to that. Let's put that on your calendars, February 26th at the Old Capitol. And then finally, I want to say a few words about something very big that we have kept under wraps, and that is the two new exhibits opening upstairs on Saturday, February 2nd. Spirits of the Passage tells the story of the transatlantic slave trade through artifacts recovered from the wreckage of a slave ship off the coast of Florida, and a companion exhibit, the Slave Series, quilts by Gwendolyn McGee, is on loan from the Mississippi Museum of Art. The exhibits will be in the FedEx and Medgar and Murley Evers exhibition halls through August 11th, and museum members are invited to a special preview of the exhibits on Friday, February 1st, during regular museum hours. So everyone come by. Uh, those are both going to be great, and it gives you another reason to become a member of the museums if you're not already. Finally, I hope that you will join us next week for History's Lunch when our speakers will be Mark LaFrancis, Robert Morgan, and Daryl White, who will present The Parchment Ordeal, 1965, Natchez, Civil Rights and Justice. Um, some of you may have seen the um, documentary that they produced on that. It aired on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. They had so much more material, especially in the way of oral histories from the folks who uh, were participants in that, that they have published this book. And so that's what they will be talking about with us. Today, we are delighted to have with us James L. Robertson to present the Dred Scott case that Mississippi got right. That story makes up the second chapter in Jimmy's new University Press of Mississippi book, Heroes, Rascals, and the Law, Constitutional Encounters in Mississippi History. James Robertson lives in Jackson, where he is a practicing lawyer, an active life member of the American Law Institute, a graduate of the Harvard Law School, he served on the Supreme Court of Mississippi for 10 years and taught law at the University of Mississippi and elsewhere. Help me welcome Jimmy Robertson. I was about to get nervous just when, when I was listening to the introduction of two of so many Jameses because for most of my life, the only person that ever called me James was my mother when she was mad at me. <laughs> and, th and then I became a lawyer and I was told that I needed to be more formal and, and needed to go by James. And I grudgingly did that. And, and the best thing James Earl Carter did for the country when he became president was make it legitimate to go by Jimmy again. <laughs> So, uh, so I, anyway, I, 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 again, I answer to those two names and, and lots of others. Um, one thing about today that's a little intimidating is I realize that there are more than two or three people sitting in the audience who assisted me considerably in uh, the preparation, of, in the research and the preparation for this book. And if I dare call out any names, I will miss somebody. So I just say, I, they know who they are, and I have tried to express my appreciation to them. Uh, I don't know how I could have done what I've done without them, 
And then, of course, there is that genie called the Internet. I don't know how in the world anybody does the kind of work that I've been able to do without the Internet. Lamar, my goodness, another friend <laughs> who, who is, uh, has quite a history, to, and a lot of it is with me, and we've, um, we've been in a lot of courtrooms in the past. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I wanted, first, the approach to, I want to tell the approach to the book, and then that will be applied to the discussion of chapter two, a chapter on, on uh, slavery law and a very, very early slavery case in Mississippi. But the general idea is, is uh, you know, lawyers never use one word when two or three will do just as well. And they generally prefer two or three boring words that are indecipherable to non-lawyers by and large. And they, you, you read and you read and you read and what did it say? What does it say? And so I'm, tr I'm trying in this story that I'm going to talk about today and in all of the others that are in the volume that um, oh, they're over here. You can, if, if, if you don't want to stay here and listen, you can just buy the book. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I try to, I go back to a, a case that I was involved in on the Supreme Court oh, years and years ago. And it was one where uh, a law clerk had helped draft the opinion, uh, and it was, the, I remember the line that you, you've heard it a thousand times, says, you know, this, this, this case is about the, you know, the, 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 the judge needing the, the wisdom of Solomon and the patience of Job. And I, I said, you know, that's, everybody's used that one a thousand times. Something needs to be added. And we kicked it around and talked about it, and the phrase that came out in the opinion is that a judge not only needs, you know, the wisdom of Solomon and the patience of Job, but the humanity of Shakespeare is what we added. And then the more, I, and that was just at that time, and I begin, that was the beginning of my thinking and realizing for, um, how many of you would ever have just, if, if nobody had ever said what I'm getting ready to say to you before, thought of law as one of the great humanities. Well, I do, and I've come to think of it that way, and I've seen it that way, and I've written about it that way, and I'm gonna tell the story in this particular, of chapter two, about a lot of interesting and flawed people. Some people that will not be very admirable to some of you, uh, some people who are, you know, are a mixed bag, uh, and some people where Damn it, I just couldn't find the whole story. It's just, uh, it, it's hard uh, to, to dig out the stuff that you need to be, sh and, and to be sure you've gotten the facts right. It, I, I hate to, the idea of, of putting down something as a fact and then somebody coming along said, well, you blew this one. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, we're going to talk about a slavery case that involved slaves that were sold and then escaped, and then it's 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 a long, long story. And the question the the question that was, nobody has been able to answer who's looked at this before is who were the slaves sold to? And um, I'll get to that point, but I I've, I've, I think I've got the answer. But I know sometimes that circumstantial evidence is only 95% right, so I get nervous. But, but I looked and tried to t tell, find the people who were involved to tell the story as they told it. Not, not necessarily as I see it, but I want to try to tell the story as it unfolded in the hands and the eyes and the thoughts and the fears and the loves and the dreams of all kinds of people. So that and that is the approach I've taken in every one of these chapters. Uh, I'll just talk about one today. Get the book and read it, to read about the rest of them. All right. He, um, I hope I'm not tied up to anything. So 
I, I, I just feel funny behind this thing, so I want to get out here just a little bit. Um, chapter 2, came to, the subject came to my attention probably about 20 years ago when a former student of mine from my teaching days at the law school, um, Mike Mills, now federal judge, and, and Mike had gone to do the um, uh, LLN program that the University of Virginia Law School has for judges, and he had written a paper on slavery law, and he one of the subjects he found and that he talked about was a case that's called Harry and Others versus Decker and Hopkins, and it is in literally in volume one of the Mississippi reports. This is the very first term of the Supreme Court of Mississippi. But when you start reading it, there are so many gaps. And, and so I've tried to, I t I've taken Mike's idea, and, what, and, and Mike, uh, I'm sure, was under the constraints of trying to produce a paper that was going to satisfy somebody who was going to give him a degree. I, I'm past that point. I'm, I'm, I'm way past that point. Uh, I, I'm partially writing for my own self-satisfaction. I'm partially writing hoping that I will open some eyes and, and cause some people to maybe think and rethink a little bit. So he, here goes. And I guess the one definition probably is, is going to be key to all of this. So I, have, are you familiar with the term freedom by residence? This was the kind of case that the Dred Scott case came out of. The idea of freedom by residence is, is that in, in the pre-Civil War days, the pre-Dred Scott days, a person who was a slave who resided in an area where it was illegal to practice slavery and if that person stayed there long enough so that thanks to the, what the owner wanted to do and the owner's plans and his business, as long as if the person stayed there long enough so that that was a, pers a, a residence, then that entitled that person in some courts to freedom by residence. Um, except that in June of 1818, Nobody had ever said that before. Mississippi became a state, as you know, in December of, of 1817. Uh, and, and it was a territory, had a territorial government before that that more or less uh, just became almost, it, with very few changes, practically a lot of changes formally, but it, by and large, it was a smooth transition from territorial Mississippi to uh, statehood, uh, December 10, 18, uh, 1817, I believe. But anyway, here's the way the story goes. And you gotta remember this term, freedom by residence. Um, there's a family of people who were from uh, Southwest, well, actually they come from Kingston in the uh, Dutch country of New York. The Deckers moved around and about 1784, think about that, 1784, that's before the Constitution. Uh, that's only a little while after Cornwallis refused to speak to George Washington and surrender. So, I mean, that's way, way back there. The Deckers moved three or four times, and they had slaves at that time. At least three, we don't know how many more. And they wound up in the southwest corner of what was then the Indiana Territory, now the state of Indiana. So, and... and it's important to remember that Indiana became the state right before Mississippi. Mississippi was uh, literally one day short of a year after Indiana became a state. But the Deckers moved to uh, 
this place, it, some people refer to it as near Vincennes. That has a, a location that had Revolutionary War implications. Uh, there's a Knox County is the area. Uh, a lot of this area was very unorganized at the time, of course. Uh, but in, the Deckers set up camp. John Decker was the man. He was the one who was in charge of the family. And he had five sons. Gave them all biblical names. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. And then there was a Luke. And, and this Luke, the New Testament guy, turns out to be the real bad guy. <laughs> but, uh, they, they, but they, and they had three daughters. But, I mean, the Decker clan was basically trying to set up their own little fiefdom in southwest uh, Indiana Territory. Now this is 1784 when they moved down there. Moved from Again, from New York, Virginia, stopped in Kentucky a little bit, and then wind up in, in Indiana. At the, that, it wasn't Indiana at the time, it was just the territory. Now three, now, I said this is in 1784. 1787, what happened then? Oh my goodness. I mean, a history teacher would flunk you guys in a minute. The Constitution. The Constitution w was, was promulgated in 1784, except that's not what I'm fishing for. What I'm fishing for is the Northwest Territory Ordinance. Did somebody say it? Who, who got it? Right. Okay. Some, one person got it right. All right. Uh, you must have read the book. <laughs> uh, the Northwest Ordinance, uh, uh, in large part, set up the ground rules for how the territories would become states. That's a lot of what it, what it did. But it, and it applied to the areas that are known now as, as basically five states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, I think a little bit of Minnesota, what is now Minnesota was in the Northwest Territory. But that, that, that ordinance was essentially talking about how those people in the, that area would form states and actually become admitted to the Union. Uh, one of the key clauses entitled Article 6 provided that slavery could not be practiced in the Northwest Territory. That is a critical fact that we'll work with in, the, in this story. Um, the also, also uh, when, you, when you get to the, the, the point where the Deckers are trying to control this area, and, and they're in, again, they're in southwest Indiana. This was Indian country. And uh, they were, the Deckers were Indian fighters, and they fought with um, uh, William Henry Harrison and, and, I mean, at the Battle of Tippecanoe. All of the, the Decker uh, boys fought with William Henry Harrison there. But th this, is a, this is the area, this is the time this is the culture we're dealing with. But the Deckers were trying very, very hard to just get control of this whole area. Obviously, their major business was agriculture related, but, but they, were going to, they were determined to run the show. All right, now you come to 1787, and the Deckers start, they start acquiring more and more slaves. Even though this, ter now the territory says, I mean, the, the, the um, Northwest Ordinance, Article 6, says you can't have slaves in this territory. They went to lawyers, the governor, I think there was a governor, St. Clair, of, of the territory, a federal official, and they catch the idea that, well, that rule may be fine, but it can't be retroactive. It can't take away slaves we already had. It can't take away property we already had uh, when it's enacted after the fact. 
same thing as what is what's in what's called the contract clause in the Constitution. You, you can't take away somebody's property, they've already got it, without just, at least just compensation. Uh, so that's another feature that's going on here. But, but the, the Deckers, they gradually realize that Southwest Indiana is a long, long way from Washington. And in those days, uh, the chances of Washington getting to where these people were and straightening them out as to whether they were complying with the sixth article of the Northwest Ordinance, uh, that wasn't likely to happen. And particularly when they had some sympathetic uh, federal officials uh, who pretty well let, put the word out, uh, you don't have to worry about anything. There actually was a situation in this, during this period of time when there, they did send a federal territorial judge to this area and he proceeded to set trials to set people uh, to consider uh, petitions for freedom by slaves and um, he was promptly run out of the country by the Deckers and a lot of others who just didn't want a federal judge meddling with the way they wanted to run their lives. Where have we heard that one before? Uh, but anyway, this, this, so this is the setup. Uh, the Deckers' businesses grow, their property, their acquisitions grow, their um, slaves grow. And there's a lot, there's a lot written about the Deckers uh, my friend Mills, when he, he wrote about this book, but he was trying to look just to find out about the people in Mississippi. He didn't chase down the Deckers. There's a lot more published material available about the Deckers. All you got to do is just get on the Internet, and it's, it's easy to find, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, but we, able, we were able to find that that complete family uh, had as many as 50 slaves at different times, and they were the big shots, and they were calling all the shots in this part of the Indiana Territory. Well, uh, everything is, is rocking along fine for the Deckers until 1816, and Indiana starts making noises towards becoming a state. And one of the things you, I mean, there's a little checklist of things you had to do uh, to qualify to become a state. Uh, you had to have a survey done of, the, of the, the outer boundaries of the state. You had to have a census done, pr practical things like that. But there was also, you had to have a constitution. And the Indiana, uh, the, the group that was petitioning for statehood uh, had their uh, constitutional convention, and they came up with a very, very strong free soil clause for the state of Indiana. This was for their state. This clause was much stricter, much more precise than what was in the Northwest Ordinance. This clause, this was adopted roughly, I think it's right at the end of June of 1816. Remember, Indiana became a state uh, in December of 1816. But they're, they're getting their ducks in the row. They're doing the things that they had to do to become a state, one of which was, was get yourself a constitution. And they've got this very, very strong free soil clause in, in there. And the Deckers are not happy. And the Deckers realize it's fine to be sitting out here in southwest Indiana knowing that uh, the Federals back in Washington are a long, long way away and uh, they're not going to give us much trouble. But this was going to be much more localized. So the Deckers realized um, they, they stood to lose a lot of their assets. And indeed, and, and right about this same time, a number of, again, the, the the free soil idea, or just the idea of freedom for slaves, took took hold once that clause was out there, and uh, a, a number of the Decker slaves 
somehow got into the hands of a Quaker colony in Indiana, and and they lost those. And and I I thought seriously about chasing that dimension of the story, but decided that I mean, you you, you got to stop somewhere. So what I was gonna what I decided to do was look only at what happened to the the slaves that were sent as they, you know, the saying goes, down the river. And literally what happened is the slaves, a, a number, was put on flat boats, keel boats. I don't, I don't know, I'm no expert on this. I, I was at one point a maritime lawyer, but the, uh, the technology had improved a good bit from the days when uh, the Deckers were using these boats to... And, and many, many others to sell slaves down the river. But what it amounted to is, as I understand it, they're flat boats. Uh, you're, e either you are chained to an area in the center of this flat surface, or you are cor corralled by uh, various kinds of cargo, so it can't be seen what's behind that cargo by somebody ashore or somebody outside. But, but the Deckers decided they needed to get rid of their slaves. Now, here's where, th this is where the, the, you know, the sleuthing has to begin. Because um, when you read what happened in Mississippi, uh, which I'm going to get to in a minute, you'll, you'll find out that the case involved the Decker, the man named Decker that was being talked about was John Decker. John was the father. John was the man who came from New York, Dutch country, moved the family to southwest Indiana. And we're talking about now 1816, and I do a little checking on, what. well, let me find out what happened to John. And John had been dead 35 years at this time. So wait a minute. All right, so who, who owns these slaves? Um, well, again, I found out that the five boys were there, and Luke, Luke took charge. Luke became the, the mouthpiece of the people in that area who were trying to preserve slavery at all costs, and particularly trying to preserve his own slaves. And then I, I get down, I, I make a trip to Natchez, looking for other aspects of this, and I find old subpoenas for documents, I mean, for persons and documents for a trial, a trial uh, which would be about the petition for freedom of these slaves. Uh, and I notice the Decker is Hiram Decker. Okay, wait a minute. There's no Hiram Decker in the so I have to go back and and run the traps again, and it turns out as yes, you guessed Hiram Decker is a third generation of the same family. So, but but at each, it, I mean, I use that as an example of the kind of detail I had to go through to try to try to be sure I had the facts halfway right. But anyway, the Hiram Decker is the, is the son, is the grandson of John, even though the opinion of the court is written as though it's all about John, it, it's, it's pretty clear that it's about the whole family and that Hiram and several of the others were down there to be witnesses. But anyway, the way they used, the, and this is, it's, this is an uh, interesting um, little uh, segue, so I went down to Natchez last night and, and made a similar presentation, and I drove down the Natchez Trace, uh, and I, the government is shut down, and therefore you don't have to worry about the 50-mile speed limit. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I mean, this, every, not everything you hear and think is bad now. <laughs> um, but but what, what, what happened, uh, though, is Isaac, one of the boys, was constantly being sent down the river on, on business. And the, and the stories of Isaac 
were that he would get to Natchez and that he would literally walk back home on the Natchez Trace. And, and that, I mean, you, you say, okay, it, st it starts at Natchez. And, and that, you can sort of decipher that one. And having driven down the Trace yesterday, um, it's not a very hospitable place. Of course, the weather was about like what you have outside now. But uh, Natchez Trace ends in Nashville. And uh, Nashville is a long way away from uh, Vincennes and Knox County, uh, southwest Indiana. But anyway, that, that's a little footnote. And just, again, trying to uh, get the feel of what life was like in this area. This is one of the major things I'm, I'm looking for. Is, is how did people live? What did they do? What were their activities? What were their businesses? What were their hopes? What were their dreams? And in, you know, at the end of the day, you look at my title, who's the hero and who's the rascal? Uh, and, and hopefully there's a little bit of each quality in most every character in this particular chapter and in all of the others. But anyway, um, Natchez has pretty good records. of things. They, they take their history seriously, as you might know. Uh, and they got pretty good records on court things, court proceedings that took place. And I find this um, s series of subpoenas for this trial, and it, it has Decker in there. And I knew the name Decker, not, not Decker, uh, Hopkins. The, the court case, the opinion of the Supreme Court that my friend Mills, my former student, now federal judge Mike Mills, wrote about, uh, it just says Hopkins. It has no name. All right. Okay, I got to find out who's Hopkins. I got to find out about Hopkins. And I did. I did find out fairly clearly that once these slaves got down to Natchez, that they were sold at a, at a Natchez slave auction, and then they somehow got into the hands of two lawyers, um, Lyman Harding and. Um, Tully, what's, his, what's Tully's first name? Anyway, the two lawyers in Natchez who are very prominent <coughs> took on their cases and they went to trial and a Adams County jury turned these slaves loose and said, you are now free. Um, okay, there are more details. That, that sounds wonderful, but let's, let's parse it out a little bit. What's, this, what's the full story? All right, first, all right, who is this guy Hopkins and what was his role? In, in, I couldn't find anything in the Indiana area that uh, was about a man ho named Hopkins. Uh, ha having been an old maritime lawyer uh, and having uh, ridden tugboats and um, been involved in, in litigation in, involving uh, boats and activities on the, on the inland waterways. I, I'm aware that sometimes the master of the vessel gets sued in addition to the owner when something goes wrong. So I, maybe, maybe this guy, um, uh, Hopkins, is the master of the vessel. Maybe he was just some, somebody who was working for... Um, the, the Deckers, but he was a, you know, a pilot on, on, on their vessel. I say pilot, uh, you know, you got to figure out Robert Fulton's steamboat, and it's just about during this period of time, and I'm not, I don't think the Deckers had a steamboat. I, I hadn't been able to, wasn't able to prove that, but I'm thinking they're just floating. I don't think they have any kind of artificial power to navigate with. And certainly they didn't coming back as Isaac is walking the Natchez Trace to get back. But so I start saying, well, how, I gotta find this guy Hopkins. This guy obviously has an important role to play in the story. So the wonderful internet. Uh, I find that there were actually, and this is, and my wife Linda helped with, she knows how to do ancestry and all that. She, she knows how to do the genealogy of people. 
And we identified four people who were alive of about the right age named Francis Hopkins. That was the name that was on the subpoena. Okay, it's got to be one of these four. Uh, except that the first three we looked at, uh, there's, there's no way. It'd be like my picking out, you know, three of you, and and just say, okay, your your name's Francis Hopkins. Okay, you're you're the winner. It was not. It didn't go like that. But the fourth one, the fourth Francis Hopkins, owned half of McIntosh County in southeast Georgia, was a major planter, always had several hundred slaves, and. Okay, the plot is thickening, and yes, I, I didn't find the smoking gun, but I did find where uh, Francis Hopkins' son uh, made a slave transaction in Natchez a, a year aside from this particular transaction. So it's got to be him. So, I'm, I mean, and this is, again, this is lawyer circumstantial evidence, but so uh, Francis Hopkins is there. Uh, we've got that part of the puzzle figured out. And then you start looking at, you, you know that um, they were freed by the jury. And then you, you look at, the, again, this is the very first term of the Supreme Court of Mississippi. The court at that time was composed of four judges. The way it worked was it, were, it would be four what would be the kinds of districts we have now for the, the circuit or chancery courts in Mississippi. You would have one, but you would have one judge for each of the four districts, and they would sit as trial judge judges, but twice a year they would get together and, and they would play Supreme Court and, and hear all kinds of appeals. So the opinion that, that, that we have here, it's, it's in uh, volume one, Mississippi reports uh, by Mr. Walker, who was the very first reporter. Uh, you've got the this, this story of this, all these slaves being, um, uh, the trial takes place. It comes down to the question of whether freedom by residence is going to be applicable. And the, again, it's important to remember what time you are at each stage of this. Freedom by residence became a major subject of discussion in the years leading up to the Dred Scott case. But in 1818, 1816, 17, and 18, no court had ever accepted it. No, I, don't, I couldn't find where any court had ever even discussed the idea. Uh, and so the question became, is Mississippi going to do something first and get it right? And you can, that's, that's when you're kind of, and of course, you look over to the last page and you see how it came out. And yes, uh, except, and, and, but what the judge in this particular case was Judge uh, Joshua Giles Clark, Clark as in Clark County. And Judge Clark presided over the Supreme Court that heard the appeal uh, from this, this proceeding in the trial court, and he has an opinion that accepts freedom by residence. Um, of course, I find out it's Clark County, and I call a few friends over there. What do you know about the, this guy that um, your county's named for? And um, I find that they know nothing. <laughs> and I find through one particular friend that let's just let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, because uh, what Judge Clark did probably wouldn't go over too well. Uh, he, he actually he did a, a, a subcase. It's not a subsidiary, but it's, it's a, another part of this story. Of, of judge, if you're looking at it from the perspective of Judge Joshua Giles Clark, who I think for a brief time was a great judge 
and Mississippi was damn lucky to have him. Uh, and this was one of the fortuities. Somebody, he was defeated in the legislature uh, for election to one of the slots, uh, but before the court got organized, this in the spring of 1818, um, the guy who had beat him in, in for that slot uh, somehow uh, got his ducks in a row with, with the President Monroe, uh, and he gets appointed to be the first federal judge of Mississippi. So Clark, it was number two in, in the election for the, the state judge, and that's how he gets in. And it's just totally fortuitous. He then, um, not only did he do something wonderful in this particular case, uh, there's another one, and, it's, and I discuss it in Chapter 2. I'd like to know more about it. Uh, he had a case in 1821 where a white man, not a slave owner, uh, not an overseer, just a white man, but who was a stranger to a, a black person who was a slave, uh, murdered the slave. And of course, if, if it's a master or an owner doing it, the penalties are not very stiff. But long story short, on the Isaac Jones case, uh, I think it's on June 27, uh, 1821, uh, on order from uh, Judge Joshua Giles Clark, uh, this man Isaac Jones uh, was hanged for having murdered a slave. You didn't have that happen there very often back in those days. But that, that's another story, and, and one of these days I may really want to try to chase that one further. But at some point, you know, you've got to stay organized a little bit and keep, keep your mind, uh, at least stay focused on the basic point. And so here comes uh, Joshua Giles Clark has got this first case. Freedom by residence has never been, re has never been recognized before. So the question is, is then, well, all right, you say these people had been living in, uh, on free soil. Been, you know, this is all in Indiana. Again, it had to be a substantial period of time. Everybody agreed to that. Uh, it, it couldn't be just passing through. If they were really, if in fact the Deckers were enjoying the, the benefits of the laws of that area that were favorable to them, uh, they had to put up with the laws that they didn't like. It's, you know, we all deal with that. We all have laws that, you know, we like better than others. And that's, and the basic idea is, uh, you know, if you can talk to the legislature into changing the ones you don't like, great, but otherwise uh, you're stuck with all of them if you're, if you're a citizen here. And that was the situation that the Deckers were in. Uh, so the question, though, is, is this territory really free soil? And the argument being that was made was that Virginia had somehow, and, and, and the process of the, the aftermath of the, uh, initially the French and Indian War and, and then the American Revolution, the question was, did Virginia actually assume dominion over these three, over these five counties, four or five states, so that they became subject to Virginia law, which you can imagine was not very favorable to free soil, at least at the time. So that was, but, and so Joshua Giles Clark analyzed that little technical question, technical as a, in a legal sense and factual, and concluded there was no evidence that Virginia ever extended its dominion over those five uh, states that were covered by the Northwest Ordinance. So this is free soil. Then you get to the, I mean, the, the, the puzzle of all puzzles. The opinion of the court that writ written by Clark talks about Harry and others and others are two in number. So that you've got Harry and you've got two others. And then I go back to the trial court. And actually there are newspaper articles 
that uh, t up as far away as Washington and Boston that talk about this trial and how these slaves were set free. And they'd say they're 28. I said, wait a minute. The case only has, the, the, the case that Judge Clark had only has three. How can this be? Again, this is surmise. I think it's logical surmise. Uh, it gets to this retroactivity idea that I mentioned. And it would have been and clearly from the standpoint of the Deckers and many people who were affected by the Northwest Ordinance and, and that Article 6, yes, they might lose some slaves, but the retroactivity principle was going to be very important. And these three slaves that were in the case, that the particular appeal were uh, those who had been acquired by the Deckers before the Northwest Ordinance was ever adopted. So you, you had the retroactivity. There was at least a good argument that the retroactivity uh, principle didn't apply. So anyway, I think I've put it basically all together. Uh, these, um, the, the opinions come out, uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful opinion. It's hard to read a little bit. There's a lot of political philosophy in it but it's obviously written by a very well-educated person. I'm talking about the opinion written by jo Joshua Giles Clark that was uh, in volume one of the Mississippi Reports that recognized the freedom by residence uh, penalt uh, premise. Again, this was the first state, the first slave state that had done that. After that, Kentucky followed suit. Virginia followed suit. Louisiana followed suit. And Missouri, which had, was not a state at the time that we're talking about now, but became a state later, followed suit. And that's really where the wars were all fought, and that's whence uh, the Dred Scott case came. So you, you had Mississippi doing something right in a pretty important way in a pretty important time and setting an example that at least four other southern slave states tried to follow. Um, of course, you come to the Dred Scott case and it all comes crashing down. And in fact, if you, in Dred Scott, you read the opinions of about 150 pages, but, but the, the key distinction is it was based on Missouri Missouri was not in that territory covered by the Article 6 of the Northwest Ordinance, and therefore the freedom by residence rule just didn't apply. And, but by that time, you're at 1857. Uh, and it's at the, the, the dissenting opinion by Judge McLean in the Dred Scott case in 1857 uh, cites Harry and others uh, for the proposition that um, uh, Chief Justice Tony, you're, you're, you're missing it on this one. Um, well, I, I could keep going on. I think I got a signal that, that this may be a good time to uh, let everybody take a breath, and particularly me, uh, and also to give um, anybody who has a question or comment, not you, Hooker, right? <laughs> but anybody who, who, who has a question, about any aspect of this, uh, um, or just a comment, I, I would be glad to entertain that at this time. Yeah. You mentioned that Judge Clark's opinion is filled with political citations or whatever. What was theories. it? Theories. Theories. If it had not been Judge Clark, would the opinion have been the same, do you think? What was the political climate at the time? Well, uh, I, and I probably misled you. The, the political philosophy that, that is expressed in that opinion is that of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, the uh, social compact doctrine. That, that's, I'm sure there were plenty of Mississippi judges uh, who didn't know what that was at the time, and I'll bet you a nickel there are plenty of Mississippi judges today that don't have a clue. 
but that, is, that was a major, the social compact idea was a major political idea in the air at the time of um, the American Revolution. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. I, now, um, one of the others was a Judge Powhatan Ellis. I, did, I hadn't run it down, but uh, I mean, I know enough about him. He might have, he might have, not, it might, it's entirely possible that uh, the, uh, the four of them, uh, was a guy named Taylor from Natchez, um, Ellis, um, I'm drawing a blank on the, on the fourth one. I don't think they all got together and discussed this, but it's, it's possible that they discussed it and then he went and wrote it. But, but it's possible that they all agreed, but I, will, I would bet you a nickel. Um, that in fact, the, just, uh, Joshua Giles Ellis was a member of the Constitutional Convention. He was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. And there are a lot of ideas in that first Mississippi Constitution that are the same as you see in this opinion. And it makes you think he probably was, was more than just a delegate who, who went there because it was going to be a big party in writing a Mississippi Constitution, so we have that for statehood. But it, it's, you know, you could reasonably deduce that the ideas from the one, they're written by the same person. It, Seemed like I remember Joshua Clark was from Southern Maryland or maybe Delaware. Is that correct? Or, or, or maybe he was some kind of relation to Thomas Rodney. And I know Thomas Rodney was from Delaware, and, and I think he was like... I, uh, I'm thinking he's from, he's from Delaware, and I think I've got that in the book. But I, I hadn't read this stuff in about two years now. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm thinking, but, uh, but um, there is a, um, in, in the course of just fishing around and trying to learn about the different players, I discover that there is a great, great, great grandson of Joshua Giles Clark, who is a history professor somewhere in central Florida. He's, he's about 85 years old now. Uh, he had some ideas that um, were a little bit um, iffy, but again, it was, and I'm almost certain that, that what you're saying is what I got from him in terms of just trying to understand the family. And that family, incidentally, uh, owned, I think Clark owns uh, six slaves, I believe. Um, but I think you're right as to, as to those, those two states. Anybody else? Yeah, yes. okay. I'm not a lawyer, not a legal scholar by any, by any stretch of that's, that's, that's no imagination. <laughs> and uh, I've not read your book. Now that I encourage. <laughs> I, um, maybe the little, law that, the little bit of law that I know is from looking at Judge Judy. <laughs> um, but, um, I don't watch Judge Judy, so I, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Help me to understand this, because I, I, I'm somewhat confused. Um, my understanding was that um, Dred Scott was a slave, and his master took him from a slave state to a, non -st to, to a free state. And then his master, um, you know, Returned him when, when he went, you know, he, he, he went to work in a free state. In, in, a, in other words, from the south. He now, I, I hear what you're saying, he was, he and I think, the, I, I think my the, answer is going to be that I, I'm going to punt. From the because south. Because I, I, uh, I, I have read the Dred Scott case yeah. a long time ago, but I don't, I, I'm not, I would come closer to accepting your version of what it says in my memory. It's a but, very long opinion. No, it's not the opinion so much as I'm trying to understand um, the, 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 the situation after um, the Supreme Court ruled that because Dred Scott was a slave, even though he, 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 Dred Scott had um, sued to be freed 
right. after he'd been taken back mm -hmm. to, to, a free, to a slave state. He was taken back by his master to, to a slave state. And then because he was living in a free state, he Dred Scott sued to, to be freed. And the Supreme Court ruled that he could not be freed. He, was, he could not be freed because he was a slave and he was property. And he couldn't sue the courts to, for, for, for them to um, for, for him to be free because since he was a slave, he, he, he was not he couldn't um, sue in, in, in the Supreme Court. That that sounds very familiar. What you just said, I, I'm I'm satisfied you you're you're correct on that. Okay. But it, that understand that that was in 1857. What we're talking about in in. Chapter 2 is 1816 to kind of 1818. The Isaac Jones case is 1821. It's a different world. That, that, was, that was the theory. Yeah, that theory was involved in the Dred Scott case, but I, I, I apologize. Uh, I'm just not. Uh, I, I just, as I, my students used to say when I would uh, be in teaching at the law schools, I'm unprepared. <laughs> if I'd known you were going to ask that question, I, I could have looked it up carefully. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, I've, I've heard you before, especially on Justice Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Okay. In the caliber of that court, I know how you probably feel about that. How would you compare that court with the Warren court and this court, the uh, Roberts court? <laughs> Roberts is very concerned about being very political. Anybody uh, bring supper? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I, I'm not, I mean, uh, as in, anybody who's read much of, of my writings knows, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was the greatest justice in the history of the Supreme Court, even though he did fight for the Yankees. Uh, and but he was—he's the best. Uh, the Warren Court. The Warren Court the, see, that was—I mean, um, I've, I've often described myself as I, I was a child of Gideon and Miranda. That is, I came out of law school just as Gideon versus Wainwright was saying everybody who's charged with a crime is entitled to a lawyer. And then about two years later, Miranda comes out and says you've got the right, you know, the right to remain silent, warnings and all of that. So I mean, that's where I, I started practicing law. That was, the, that was probably, if anything, a bigger issue than uh, what we're going to do about Brown versus Board of Education as a practical matter to me as a lawyer, because I was getting a, appointed to defend people uh, in, in cases as a result of those Warren Court decisions. I happened to think they were wonderful, and I thought the Warren Court was wonderful. Uh, it would, you, 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 but you can't paint with a broad brush like that. You, you've, you've got, th there are hundreds of decisions in the Warren Court and I'm sure if I, if you give me a little time, I could show you some pretty bad ones. On the other hand, um, there's some that are wonderful. No, and and that's that that that, that again. Not only did you bring supper, uh, the, the, I mean, the question of whether or not the courts are in politics and should be in politics is a huge question, and the level of ignorance about its parameters in Mississippi is absolutely massive. Uh, and I'll give you the particular. Uh, when the current Supreme Court of Mississippi wants to duck a tough case, they love to say, well, this is a political question and the court shouldn't uh, mess with this. And I'm thinking, where were you people born in 1983 when at that time, over about 20 odd years, the legislature had 
put its members on about 15 or 20 state boards and agencies so that the legislature was totally controlling the executive branch of government. And I was on the court and I, I mean, and with this wily old fox named Neville Patterson, who was the chief justice, uh, he, uh, he wrote this opinion that put a stop to all of that. That's the most hugely political case in the history of the state of Mississippi. And how you can, and the difference is, you had a wily old fox like Neville Patterson handling that one. And you have curmudgeons doing, dealing with some of these today. <laughs> Probably the right place to end it. As you can tell, this is a great far ranging book. Uh, we have copies of it for sale over here, and uh, Nathan Weber has done everybody right by putting out some fresh coffee for the cold and rainy day. Make sure that we don't leave any of that here. Thank you all for coming. Help me thank Jimmy Robertson for this fabulous book. Thank you. Thank you.